I'd like to uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, I was almost fired for trying to start at ten minutes to one, but recognise that our distant audience uh, has been led to expect a start at one o'clock. So here we are at the start of what is labelled on the overhead as a lunch and final report. It's perhaps more appropriately defined as the final lunch and report. I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I'd also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. We are indeed fortunate to be here as a group of emeriti, all of us in one sense or another interested in the place in which we live and work and greatly interested in the implications of the climate and nature emergency. This is a disorganized organization for which I claim full responsibility, uh, but we have agreed, one of the, I think the second thing that we've agreed as a cohort, that we will go by alphabetical order in presentation. So all the members of the cohort have been asked to make a few comments. And a logical and fortunately humane thing is for us to start with Joanne. And I would just say, first of all, before she speaks, that the honor of having Joanne as a member of this cohort is quite extraordinary. You probably know that she's a representative of the First Nations community who has pioneered the whole indigenous program on the campus, has been the leader of the First Nations House of Learning, has kept us, all of us, aware of the importance of the larger community that she represents. And I want a special word of thanks to her for the way in which she has led one of the most interesting of the sessions which we experienced, a session having to do with the relationship between the alignment of indigenous law and the implications of climate change in the Chilcotin country. And uh, that was one of the, the highlights of our program. So I'd like to thank you uh, publicly, Joanne, and ask you to say a few words for us, as I know you have obligations elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. Um, <clears throat> Are we ready? Oh, great. Well, thank you everyone for coming out to have an in-person lunch and for those on the Zoom. Uh, it's um, wonderful to be together in, in two different ways here. And I want to share a few reflective comments about being a part of the cohort, uh, Climate and Nature Emergency. Uh, when I was asked to participate, I thought, oh, I'm not sure how much I know about climate and nature emergency, but I also thought it was a good learning opportunity for me and to learn from the other cohort members and to also uh, have Indigenous perspectives um, considered within this cohort. So my background, I am Stalo, a member of the Stalo Nation. I grew up in the Fraser Valley, Cultus Lake area. And I also have ancestry in the Statlium 
um, nation uh, near Lillooet. So Stalo means river. So we are people of the river and very much interconnected to the resources of the river and the environment um, that, that is so close to our various river systems. So in this cohort, personally, I have gained a broader understanding and deeper appreciation of the issues, actions, possibilities, and difficulties related to climate and nature emergency. During our various sessions, the other cohort members have shared their expertise, experiences, concerns, and considerations for dealing with urgent problems of climate change, environmental impact, social justice, uh, impact on various communities, human overconsumption, and the multidimensional impact on Indigenous communities. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to, to talk and think and learn across our disciplines. I come from the Faculty of Education, and, and um, I, it, it was just a great experience to learn from my other cohort members from different disciplines. The um, invited speakers of this uh, series also added much to the conversations our cohort members had, and certainly shared their, um, I think, breadth of uh, expertise with many who participated in the various uh, speaker sessions. So many of the speakers shared stories and insights of working with Indigenous peoples, particularly First Nations in British Columbia, in which Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous sovereignty, Indigenous opposition, adaptation, and relationships were experienced. Many of our speakers had either worked with various Indigenous communities, whether it's First Nations, Inuit, Métis, um, and I appreciated that thoughtful engagement of our various speakers because many of them, I, I would say their research I could characterize it as with Indigenous communities, not on Indigenous communities, which has been very problematic for a number of years. <clears throat> Despite experiencing issues of colonization and racism during environmental emergencies, some First Nations communities are developing and practicing cultural and local approaches for sustainability of their lands and resources. So we had uh, one of our speakers talk about um, her work. Uh, um, that was um, Dr. Jocelyn Stacy. her work with the Tsokotin people. And... This was during some of the um, emergency um, actions that happened during the wildfires and during COVID. And uh, certainly the issues between RCMP and Indigenous communities certainly surfaced. But it was important to hear that story, but then to appreciate that the Tsokotin people, you know, have really been leading, I think, the, the movement about self-determination and sovereignty, and that a faculty member from UBC, you know, has been able to work cooperatively, you know, with th this particular Indigenous nation uh, to uh, add her expertise along with um, the expertise of the Indigenous people. And I think that's an important recognition that has come about a little bit through some of the speakers, but certainly the implications that they talked about, that Indigenous communities are becoming more engaged despite still experiencing racism, but that they persist 
uh, because they 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 believe uh, you know in their inherent right for self government. They are practicing their indigenous teachings, which really are uh, important for nature, uh, for sustainability, for nourishing the environment, that close connection that Indigenous peoples have who live on the land and who live with nature. There's a couple of thoughts that have you know, surfaced for me and in what some of the speakers presented. Maybe they asked a question or implied a particular uh, idea. And, and one of these ideas relates to uh, shifting perspectives. So the shifting perspective is one where um, an appreciation um, of and learning from indigenous peoples, you know, has has surfaced, and this is with indigenous peoples who continue to develop, sustain, and nourish their symbiotic relationships with nature, and with and and a term that we use more more than humans, you know. So all those who are more than humans, that's a very important part of our indigenous worldview, having relationships there um, that are mutually beneficial. But sometimes, of course, there are issues there. The other part is perhaps valuing this perspective as a land or nature ethic, you know, that nature and more than humans are like our kin, like our extended family. And if we believe in good relationships within families, and I know, you know, there are tensions and issues, of course, with families, but to think of, you know, when it comes down to it, it's often, you know, the families that, that are there for us when we really need them. So if we think that with Indigenous peoples, you know, our, our Indigenous stories and, and, um, ways that we know the world, the environment is our kin, you know, that we have this close, close relationship with the mountains, the rocks, the rivers, the land. So we might think about yeah. our perspective about land, the land ethic, so we love it and care for it, rather than commodify it, for example. So one other thought um, is in relation to an ethical question that one of the speakers raised, and it was, does the developed world have a responsibility to assist the developing world? Well, I, th I thought about this shift in perspective and wondering, whose perspective and which criteria is, is there for the developed world? And the same with developing world. Sometimes I think the developing world has not had as much impact, negative impact on nature as the developed world. And some of our speakers provided some data on that. Yet, the so the quote, uh, developing countries suffer the most with climate emergencies. So I wondered about this shift of thinking of developed and developing, maybe in that that the countries where who that are causing less climate and nature emergency are those we could learn from, just like we have been learning from indigenous peoples you know, that we can learn from their worldview, how they treat nature, um, the philosophies, um, then some of the, the practices that, that could, uh, that maybe are thought of as traditional, but also are practiced today. 
So I've been thinking more about this term of developed and developing and wondered how we might shift our thoughts about that. So that's uh, what I wanted to share uh, as, as my, you know, continuing learning that I've appreciated um, through the cohort and through the speakers, and that I think this is a, like a journey. So I started, now I'm learning a bit more, hopefully contributing something, but yet there are a lot more journeys to take. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. Your presence has always been an inspiration to the cohort. And now I'd like to ask uh, Penny Gerstein to make some comments. So thank you. Um, I, I noticed we're, we're getting rid of, uh, we're, we're having all the 22% of the people, of the, the people who identify as female uh, starting off, right? <laughs> right? Okay. In our cohort. Yes. <laughs> totally planned. Okay. So uh, thank you, Joanne. I mean, that's, that was a very, um, uh, really, really very thoughtful uh, sort of ideas around this. I, um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm um, a professor emeritus It's uh, uh, I guess January 2022 um, from the School of Community Regional Planning, and um, my background has was a little bit <laughs> parapietic. Uh, I uh, started out with a degree in sociology with a minor in, in fine arts, and then three degrees in architecture in a bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Um, and I and I worked a little bit as an architect, but I found out that was not the way to go. <laughs> Um, so I ended up, my career has been in, in planning. Um, and so, so when I came, when I was asked to be part of this cohort, my perspective has always been, you know, where, you know, action, you know, where, what can we do to sort of move things forward in the, in this? And I really appreciated the discussions we actually had. We had some really good discussions that recognized you know, the, that, you know, the issues around political will, the issues around the inequities that are, that, uh, that uh, cry, the, the climate emergency is presenting itself. Um, the, the issues around looking at different cultures, and, and I think uh, Joanne has really eloquently uh, identified, you know, how other perspectives need to be part of this. Um, one of the other cohorts, and I'm sure he's going to be talking. It's also is he's done work in 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 with the Inuit communities and and sort of learn learn from from them. And so, you know, I I really felt that that was sort of a very important part of it. I really appreciated um, the speakers, and I I learned I think a lot about the impact, uh, really significant impact on uh, which I already vaguely new but it really came home to me of on on um of, of populations uh, uh uh you know that are they're going to be extinct soon um you know they're, they're sort of whole whole regions that may be uh, totally changing their their um their climate um and also um the fact that um and this really brought home to me from our I guess our third last speaker was how um, we are. We're talking now. I mean, and, and this week yeah. we've talked about uh, in the in the media they are uh, uh, talking about you know we're we're entering into the one point five degree change. Well, he well this speaker said. Um, you know, forget about the 1.5 degree. We're, we really have to talk about the two degree. We haven't even started talking about what the two degree impact would have on our, on our, our climate and in our environment. And uh, given what's happening now with the forest fires and the, and the extreme heats and the droughts and all this sort of thing, we're, we're really entering into a very, very scary period. Um, so, there so what can we do <laughs> that that was always put in my mind so what we did uh we we got to um 
through a very interesting route, uh, we started talking about what UBC could be doing. And it just so happens that UBC has, a, um, uh, they, they're going through a planning process, a strategic planning process. And we looked at the various documents they produced and were quite appalled. Um, it was basically business as usual. They didn't recognize what, you know, what the impact of such a large institution, which is like the largest institution in, in the Vancouver area, could, could do if it really took a climate emergency seriously, if it really took house, affordable housing seriously, if it took a whole range of things. And so um, one of our, uh, one of our key uh, uh, you know, products that we did is we actually wrote a letter um, to um, the Board of Governors. Um, no, it was actually, yeah, it was the Board of Governors. Yeah, it was the Board of Governors. And we did, um, I mean, we were asked to come to some meetings. We may not be going meeting with the Board of Governors, which would be really good. But at least we're, I, I felt that we had an opportunity to say, you know, hold it. You know, you're not you're, you're really, you know, you could say these words, but nothing in the, in the planning documents really show that, that UBC is going to be changing its practices in any significant way. So that's one thing I think I really took from this is that we really need to be, you know, because we need to be engaging in these conversations in a really profound way. And we have, we have this, a very privileged position as emeritus uh, to be doing that. I mean, nobody is going to have to, you know, nobody's going to criticize us. Nobody's going to, you know, or they might criticize us, but who cares? We're, we're way past that now. So, you know, I think we could really, you know, I, I think, you know, if each of you thought of what you could be doing, I think that would really, I, I mean, in a very small way would, would help. And I, I really, um, I sort of commit to seeing where I can be engaging in the UBC process because I sort of gave up because I've had you know, over the, my my career, which is like over 30 years, you know, I've engaged in various processes and I said, okay, forget it, you know, but I really do feel like I need to be doing, to be engaging in that again. And then finally, I just wanted to mention um, that we're, this cohort is part of a larger um you know, uh, a, a group that for, in the Peter Wall that's that's looking at uh, climate emergency uh, emergencies, and I really appreciated that opportunity to get engage with them. Uh, we only had what we had is these lunches uh, once a month to engage with the different cohorts. There was an undergraduate student cohort. There was a um, faculty cohort. There was a, a staff cohort. Um, that were, you know, were sort of meeting, there were, um, and, you know, artistic performances going on, there was sort of real kind of excitement among, among the youth, um, among, you know, people around what they could be doing. Um, but I also, uh, I, again, I really felt that the emeritus faculty could really be contributing to that dialogue, probably in a more meaningful way th than we did. And again, I want to you know, harken back to what uh, uh, Andrew Weaver, who we had, uh, came to talk to us, and he was very concerned about what um, what is being conveyed to people. You know, may uh, is, you know what what kind of information they're getting may not may be uh, really clouding their perspectives about what they could be doing and what the whole picture is. So um, it's unfortunately, he doesn't want his presentation to be uh, uh, widely available because it was excellent. And I, I, I learned a lot from that about, you know, how do you, uh, it's really important given in this period of disinformation and people sort of getting into, you know, these sound bites and grabbing on to, you know, bits of information that don't have, that really are not, uh, they're not the true story. Um, of how important the marriages faculty could be in really tailing it. Maybe we're tailing it in a very boring way, and maybe we might be very repetitive, but I, I do think we have this wealth of knowledge uh, to convey. So thank you. Thank you, Penny. I think the excitement and the 
involvement in housing issues that you are such an expert at come through in the passion with which you talk about the general objectives of this cohort and thank you for for doing that so the next person i think on the alphabet uh, is ralph if you kindly come forward yeah and we're, we're not insured so it's okay <laughs> I, I make that comment because I was on a cruise for three weeks, and on the first day I, I I'm just back a week. The first day I tripped, uh, da damaged my arm, my leg, whatever. It, it got infected, and I spent the cruise with an elevated leg, not allowed to go ashore anywhere. Twenty one days of that, uh, so I'm very cautious coming in and out. Um, my name's Ralph Matthews. I'm a sociologist. Uh, in terms of, of length of time, I've been, I was a professor for 51 years, which is rather too long, at three different universities. Uh, I'm emeritus professor at McMaster University, and then I came here and I, I did 20 plus years here, and I'm an emeritus professor here. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about what climate change is and what our role and what I think we articulated in being, being part of this cohort. The, the articles in the press, and they're there today in numerous things uh, on the websites and the news sites that we're going to reach the 1.5 degree that, that was referred to earlier. And the presentations, are almost inevitably about the biochemistry and the biophysical issues related to climate change. And as a sociologist, for me, climate change is a social phenomenon. Uh, the social does get mentioned and it got mentioned by many of our speakers, but Usually it's uh, climate change will occur, these physical things will happen, and they will have these social impacts. And climate change has social causes. Climate change is the product of, of, of being, of the way we organize our lives, politically, socially, uh, institutionally, about our cultures, and about our behaviors. And if we're going to deal with climate change in an effective way that does something to actually reverse it, the focus has to be on the way in which the social articulates with the science, articulates with the evidence and says, how do we create, do, do we change the social processes, the social structures, the social behaviors we engage in, so that we actually shape something that's different. It's a different way of doing things. And the wonderful advantage of this set of interactions we've had as a cohort has been that, uh, that Penny, Franco speak uh, subsequently, Graham are, are, and myself are essentially bringing a social eye to a biological phenomenon. And we're able to have that discussion about it and to ask the various people who, who presented, you know, what can we do to make change? And that's the important thing I think we have to do. What, 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 just so you know where that comes from, I've spent much of my career working at the community level, uh, particularly in BC. I've worked with a, a number of First Nation communities uh, around issues my, primarily of resource management. I've seen we've done more stuff on, on, on fish and fisheries structures and behaviors and how, how people organize resource extraction from fisheries, from forestry, et cetera. And there we really do have to think, what are our behaviors and what are our social processes? that precede rather than just are the consequence of, of climate change and restructure that. I, 
I, I, I, I, I having a wonderful time, Don, with you. You're nodding beautifully, and I'm glad someone is doing so because it helps me. Have you ever noticed when you teach, you cannot not lecture to a nodder? If someone in your class nods, you discover you've just given a third of the lecture to that person. Uh, that uh, it's amazing how we're influenced. The Penny referred to the the our, our engagement with the long long range planning process at, and and the document and and that discussion, and that's I think to me. Because it's 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 as, as practical as those documents get. Uh, it's a practical way to take what we engaged with, what we heard, and say how we will do it. And I, I make a bad joke about this: that planning usually has an edifice complex; that it's it's all about the building, and not about the social process. Uh, that that plan doesn't do that. It, it doesn't, it's, it's, it, it's about building neighborhoods, it's about green spaces in some places, et cetera. But as Penny said, it, it doesn't say, and how do we change what we put in? What will that change anyway in the post-COVID IT, AI conditions of the world that will transform the process of dealing with both how we understand climate change, how we change it, and how we assess the impacts. Uh, just to give you this going through my head as I talk about it, one of the studies I did was in the city of Whitehorse. And the, the, the city manager, when I interviewed him said, you know, dealing with climate change is perfect storm, which I thought was a wonderful metaphor when you're talking about climate change. For, for a city planner, he said, because all of the regulations come from Ottawa, come, come, come from central government, some level. And we're supposed to implement them at, at the civic level without a budget, without the staff, without the capacity. And we have to restructure that. Back to the UBC plan. It basically says, we're going to create a campus this way. And it, it's, it, it's it's done with good intent. It's done. It's it's the pictures are good. The, it's, you know it shows what will happen, and it's and then it says at the end, and we'll take into account the issues of climate change as we do this. Now, if I were writing that report, and this is what came out of our discussions too, if I were writing that report, I'd reverse it and I'd just say, these are our climate goals, these are the social processes that that we and see we have to incorporate. And this is in order to effectively mitigate climate change in, in, and, and its impact. And, and this is how we will go about doing that. Not, this is the plan we will have and we will, we, we, we will uh, look at climate change when, as a result. And I think, we have to think, uh, I, uh, my, my approach is, as, as I said earlier, on the, the practicalities of how we operationalize as a social process, the, the, the issues of climate change. And this has been highly effective in doing that. There's one other concept, and I think Frank is going to talk about it. Uh, and if Bill Reese was here, he would have talked about it very much so, but he couldn't be here today. The concept of overshoot, that we have a tendency to plan for more than the carrying capacity of the environment. And, and that is what overshoot is about. And we're going to, we, we've had effective discussions about that, I think. And, and, and we, we, we need to think of how, not just how we adapt, because there's too much problems with trying to adapt to climate change. We still have opportunities to mitigate the processes. And that's where we need to start. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Your input has been invaluable. It's unfortunate that you had to be away at the last uh, in the last week, and perhaps your accident is a, in, <laughs> is punishment for that absence. But we do appreciate your perspective from a 
a real sociologist. Now I guess that Bill Reese is next and he's not here. So that makes me next, I think. If my alphabet is still current. My name is Olaf Slaymaker. I grew up in Norway for seven years of my life and then lived in Wales from the age of seven until the age of 18 and uh, went through various educational traumas en route. But perhaps the biggest trauma was when I arrived at UBC in 1968. I know some of you were not born at that time, but most Emirati were. When I arrived in 1968, I was informed by the head of my department that I was to teach the geography of environmental change. So in this what slightly fanciful story, Olaf says to the head of department, okay, I'm up for it. When can I start a new course with that title? The head of, the head of department in response to Olaf says, hmm, I'm afraid we have not got such a course on the books and you will have to use one of the courses in the UBC calendar. It will take at least two years before a new course can be approved. We have a recently approved new course called Physiographic Hydrology. Why don't you use that? Olaf, thinking to himself, says, this sounds like a formidable course title. I may not, may not attract any students. So he says to the head of department, perhaps I could use the university's field school in the Okanagan as a promotional tool. Head of de department in response to Olaf, unfortunately, Geography does not have a field school, and if you insist on teaching such a course, new resources will be needed, and the dean of our faculty, popularly known as Dean Won't, will take a lot of persuading. Olaf, in response to the head of department, would it be possible to teach my special research interest? Introduction to geomorphology. Head of department to Olaf, I'm afraid that the geology department already has a course of that title on its books at third year level, so it would not be possible to replicate in the Faculty of Arts a second year course that is already an upper level course in a different, different faculty. The objections were numerous, and this was happening in the first week of September of 1968, just as I was about to face my first class of 250 avid students in Geography 101. So my enthusiasm for getting involved with research in environmental change was rapidly eroded within the department at that time. On the other hand, to my surprise and delight, UBC already had an Institute of Resource Ecology headed by the charismatic Professor Buzz Holling and a faculty of forestry with a senior faculty member in forest hydrology, Professor Walt Jeffrey, who came to my personal rescue and to the rescue of several of my original graduate students. In addition, David Suzuki was still involved as a zoology professor, though moving more fully into public science. And Irving Fox from the Resources for the Future was appointed director of the Westwater Research Institute in 1970 who with his wife, Rosemary Fox, was a powerful influence on establishing the Sierra Club in BC in 1969. There was a gathering chorus of environmental scientists in the community, inspired by Greenpeace. Some of us joined the Ross Committee, the Runout Skagit Spoilers Committee. Several of us were involved with the federal government initiatives in the field of environmental impact assessment. At the 1972 Stockholm Conference, guided by Maurice Strong, a controversial Canadian businessman, who then convened the first international expert group meeting on climate change, which eventually led to the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992 and the IPCC reports. So all this to indicate that the department's 
lack of enthusiasm was complement, complemented by the huge upsurge of interest in the topic of environmental change in our society. There's another section to this report, which will be reported <laughs> in the newsletter in due course, which has to do with the development of my perception of the problem as it is defined within the climate and nature emergency, which all of us have had some uh, attempts at redefining and re refocusing. But I'm supposed to say something about what I've learned from this cohort. And I just wanted to indicate a little bit about my background. First of all, it's been a privilege to be part of this cohort. The number of different dimensions from nine individuals, even though we have only six here, uh, has deepened my appreciation of the whole question of the climate and nature emergency. The fact is that this is not a climate dilemma, but that humanity's relationship, and specifically our kinship with nature, is at the heart of the issue. Our demands on nature through resource extraction have exceeded the ability of nature to sustain us. In short, a change of mind is urgently needed. So I have, by the good grace of uh, our colleague, got a, photo, uh, a slide here, which is simply a summary of the extraordinary ways in which the climate and nature emergency has evolved. And in particular, I would draw your attention, you can see it. Okay, no, that's better. But the line here, which actually represents the date of 1950, and which is repeated in each of these graphs, shows you that in every conceivable parameter, and these are not just biophysical parameters, these are indeed social parameters as well as biophysical, every one of them increasing at a logarithmic rate. And uh, so one goes on the biophysical side from the carbon dioxide question, which initiated much of the discussion, but on the other side to the population and to the real GDP of the per capita, or from the various aspects of the pollutants on the, ones, on the one hand, to the different ways in which energy is used uh, on the economic side. The fact is that we know that this has been going on, and as both Joanne and Penny and Ralph have also already said, the real question is what on earth can we do about it? What we're looking at in these graphs is the cumulative effects of business as usual. What we have experienced in, in the cohort is the benefits of enforced interdisciplinarity. Each of us has strayed from his scholarly expertise in order to address this broad question. It's, these have been some of the best experiences of interdisciplinarity since my undergraduate experience at, at a university. The potential implications for the programming at Emeritus College and whatever, at whatever institution takes the place of Peter Wall Institute of Advanced Studies uh, are blatantly obvious, and we hope that this will be possible to, to do something in, in that respect. I personally still think the, the value of approaching the whole emergency is best carried out at several scales. The local, regional, and national scales are more accessible. The global scale is almost certainly a disaster. So we have possibilities for hope 
and expression of new ideas at the more local scales. But so far, we've not come up with anything sensible to deal with the global scale. And there are many reasons for that. So this graph that you have before us is simply showing the desperately dangerous state of our global environment. As between 1950 and 2000. And the interesting, uh, if we apply, if we apply the Madison, Madison Project database from 2018, the trajectory of the Anthropocene, the general, the, the gross, the GDP per capita in 2011 US dollars has grown from 723 in the year 1000 CE. If you can imagine how the calculation was done for 1000 CE, and it's grown to 14,574 in 2016. In other words, it's increased by a factor of 20, demonstrating the extraordinary inter interdependence of humanity and its exploitation of the environment. So it's been a privilege for me to be part of this uh, group, and I really want to express my thanks to each of them for their humility and generosity and extremely uh, effective communication of ideas. Thank you. Next, I guess, is Frank. In uh, last September, I found myself in a community on the northern tip of Baffin Island which many of you would recognize as Arctic Bay, Ikbiarjuk in Inuktitut. And I found myself sitting in front of a woman by the name of Kapik Adagutsiak. Kapik Adagutsiak was and is 102 years old. I was there because I have been, uh, after spending three years dealing with a proposal to expand an iron ore mine on the northern tip of Baffin Island, was asked to take a look at the impact that climate change is having on a species that Inuit on the northern tip of Baffin Island not only have depended on historically for food, but which in fact are the underpinnings of a unique uh, culture which still has the form of the one of the oldest uh, forms of social and cultural organization on the planet, a hunting and gathering culture. And uh, when Kapik uh, discovered or remembered that I had been living in uh, Arctic Bay in the 1970s, I lived there for two years while I was doing a degree in architecture and environmental studies, having decided that I didn't want to be a doctor and that I wasn't interested in running a business. Um, she realized that her, her late husband, Adagutsiak, had taken me by snowmobile uh, all the way from Arctic Bay down to the southern tip of Admiralty Inlet, a journey of about 260 kilometers over a polar bear pass, which believe me was well named, and back up the other side of the Bordeaux Peninsula into Lancaster Sound. Well, that was it. We were set for a whole afternoon of uh, back and forth and discussion and so forth and so on. The thing that uh, struck me with someone who was 102 years old and incredibly lucid and thoughtful was that uh, she put me in a totally different world. One where when she talked about Narwhal, um, she talked about Narwhal as if they were next door neighbors, as if they were seasonal visitors that they were glad to see, respected, had conversations with, cared about, 
and depended upon, in fact, historically for their own survival. It was a completely unassuming, delightful, uh, unbelievable uh, conversation with someone whose relationship with Narwhal was, as I've just said, kind of like the friend or neighbor next door that drops by for the season for a visit and has to be treated with a certain amount of respect and recognized in a particular way in order to make sure that the Narwhal are happy, um, that they're glad to be there, that their value is appreciated, and that they'll come back for another visit next year. Needless to say, ice conditions in the high Arctic upon which Narwhal depend for reasons that I won't get into are changing dramatically with what I believe will be very uh, dramatic impacts on the viability of this particular species in the high Arctic. I um, came away from that, it was not an interview, it was a conversation. Um, by getting back in touch with something that had happened to me in the 1970s when I was a student living in um, Arctic Bay. And as I've just said, I went down Admiralty Inlet with Atagutsiak and a, a primitive uh, snowmobile, 18 horsepower um, snowmobile. And uh, halfway down the inlet, we went down in February, it was 40 below zero. And uh, I jumped, uh, I, uh, uh, lead in the ice with my machine and broke one of the skis. And Adagutsiak had, because he had a trap line and he was spending uh, a lot of time down around the south end of Admiralty Inlet, had a cache with some supplies in it further, much further on down the inlet and uh, decided that uh, he would go and get a spare ski so that we could repair the one on my snowmobile. And when I realized that, you know, myself sitting on the back of his snow machine with only an 18 horsepower motor on the back of it was really going to slow things down, I said, well, look, why don't I just wait here for you? And he looked at me and he said, are you sure? I said, sure, uh, let's just build a, you know, a little wall of snow blocks to keep the wind off my back. And he made a little snow bench and gave me a 303 rifle. And I, he said, yeah, I said, well, uh, he wasn't sure how long it would be before he got back, but he said it'd be quite a while. And of course, it was uh, pitch dark, but it wasn't dark at all. The uh, aurora borealis was firing away overhead, and and uh, when it wasn't too bright, you could see just about every star in the sky that you could ever imagine. I was a smart-ass student. You know, I just spent years in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Western Ontario, and I was now studying architecture and environmental sciences and uh, I was really keen on statistics which is what I ended up teaching my first course when I ultimately ended up teaching in the School of Social Work at the University of Calgary. Uh, I, 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 I knew a lot and there I was you know six hours later with my polar bear skin pants and my caribou skin jacket at 40 below zero sitting on a snow bench in the middle of Admiralty Inlet, waiting for Adagutsiak to come back with a, with a ski for a skidoo, and realizing that if he didn't, something happened to him and he didn't come back, I was going to have to make my own way on foot back to Arctic Bay, which was about 120 kilometers away at 40 below zero. I wrote an essay about this experience, which I think will summarize what happened to me while I was sitting there uh, contemplating my surroundings and keeping an eye open for polar bear. I uh, wrote an essay about all of this, uh, which was entitled, uh, Being Small in a Big Place. This experience had the most profound impact on who I became and how I think. And I think if I had to put a word uh, on it to ca capture uh, many dimensions of it, I I'd simply say that it was an amazingly humbling experience. That suddenly, you know, uh, everything that I knew was utterly irrelevant. Everything that Adagutsiak knew about how to survive in 
this particular climate was what really mattered. And what I had or hadn't learned about that could make the difference between whether or not I, I survived or not in the event that he didn't come back. And to make a long story short, he did come back and we carried on our trip. And um, I, I, I say that because uh, I, I, to this day, feel that uh, I'm a bit of an outsider I'm, a, I'm an academic that's not an academic. I, I, my, my father, for example, was someone who could barely read or write. He never graduated from public school. My mother got to grade 10, and in those days she could go to normal school and get a teaching certificate and taught in one-room rural schoolhouses in, in Ontario. I consequently grew up in a very poor working-class family. Uh, when I first got a job teaching at the University of Calgary, I was quite embarrassed by the fact that I looked at what I was being paid and realized that I was being paid more than my father was making, having worked for a company in Dundas, Ontario for, uh, for almost 35 years. So I made sure that I never told him what my salary was. Um... I look at the academy, I guess, with a bit of a jaundiced eye sometimes. I, I think that we think we know a lot more than we do. And what we really need to know, and this is particularly true of dealing with something like climate change, what we really need to know is something that really isn't taught very well, isn't dealt with in an academic environment. We need an attitude, and it's an attitude that Indigenous peoples have. It's the sort of thing that Capic uh, shared with me. We need a sense of uh, connectedness. We need to be regrounded with who we are, where we come from, and where we ultimately will all end up. And uh, the relationship that we're missing entirely within a university where our objective is to develop, grow, control, modify, change, use to our advantage. You can fill in so many phrases that capture what higher education is all about that I could stand here for the next hours or giving them out one after the other. It's humility that we're missing, but it's not just humility. It's the kind of humility that comes from really getting back in touch with the planet that we live on with what Indigenous peoples refer to as Mother Earth. And that's, I think, what these <laughs> graphs that uh, Olaf referred to, and which I shared with him when he was asking me, you know, I've got anything that makes the point quite well. And I said, well, I've just come across it. I'm familiar with many of these, but I've just found an article that gathers all these graphs that I've been looking at for years into two pages. And you don't have to know what each one of them represents. Just take a look at it. Every one of them is an exponential curve. And as Olaf pointed out, they all take off, especially starting about 1950. There is something seriously wrong with us. There's something wrong with our arrogance. There's something wrong with the idea that, you know, we can do all the things that we're trained to do, that uh, universities train students to do, and come out in good shape at the other end. And it's pretty obvious from, you know, what's going on in Alberta right now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and things that Ralph has talked about, uh, and Penny and those who've gone before me, that there's, there's something seriously wrong. We missed the boat somewhere. What have we been teaching? What have we learned? What sort of intangible, if you like, values, attitudes, beliefs, understanding, sensibilities, fill in the blank, have we been passing on to our colleagues and our students for the last X number of years? That's the question that I have as a result of listening to many of the presentations. My conviction is this, that we're on the wrong path. And Ralph hinted at this. He talked about overshoot. I want to take the concept of overshoot a little bit further. I want to talk about belief systems, ways of making sense, ideologies, theologies, if you want. We've missed the boat. The problem is that we are, to put it in the vernacular, <clears throat> we are consuming ourselves to death. 
And if I make that observation, the next question that I ask, and this comes out of listening to many of the presentations, the next question that I have is, what exactly does that mean? What does that look like? What is wrong here? I don't for a minute believe, and uh, I guess I'm speaking with Bill Rees here, I don't believe for a minute that the problem is a technical one that can be solved by some sort of technical fix. That if we all end up driving electric cars, you know, things are going to be much better. If that we all use solar and wind power, things are going to be much better. Having dealt with a mine in the high Arctic for the last three years, I'm well aware of what, you know, mining all of the resources, all of the metals, all of et cetera, et cetera, to produce solar panels, wind generators, and electric cars, I have a pretty good idea of what that looks like in terms of impact on the environment. This is going nowhere. So what is overshoot? I, I want to leave you with this observation. We have an ideology. We have a way of making sense. We're almost afraid to use the word because as soon as you do, you know, it takes you back to the 70s where some of us were using the word and were labeled as communists or Marxists or whatever. But the truth of the matter is, and globalization has now exported this way of making sense to the entire planet, we live with an economic system which economists refuse to examine critically, most of them. Uh, it's called capitalism. It's an ideology. It's a way of making sense where accumulation is the objective of what it means to be human and living on the planet. And by accumulation, I don't just mean in terms of material things, accumulation in terms of power, accumulation in terms of wealth, all of which comes at a horrible price to the environment. So I'd like to take the word overshoot and add to it. You know, the culture, that it's not just an economic system. It's a culture. It's a way of making sense. It's an ideology. It's a belief system that's killing us. And we're, we don't go there. When I listen to people talk about climate change, they talk about technical fixes. They present all the data and so forth and so on. But they don't get down to the rock bottom, if you like, to the base that lies behind us, the thinking, the ideology, the sensibility that underlies the logic and the activities that have produced one exponential curve after another. This is unsustainable, absolutely unsustainable. We are consuming ourselves to death. And consolidating those ideas, thinking back on my you know, experience working with Inuit uh, in the Eastern Arctic and just having finished writing a book for uh, primarily for high school students on all the relocations that took place in the Eastern Arctic as we went about trying to assimilate and destroy and uh, drag kicking and screaming Inuit into the logic that I've just labeled. Uh, I am reminded of all of this as a result of the experience I've had, thanks to Olaf and all of you uh, being here and listening to many presentations and then going away and doing some of my own thinking and, um, and listening to some of the uh, Inuit that I've been working with and whom I've known for, well, my entire adult life. So uh, I want to thank them because I really and truly owe who I am and how I think to people like Kapik at Gutsiak. And I also want to thank Ola for the opportunity. So in my uh, less than perfect, Enuktitut Mutna Koyanamik, thank you. Thank you, Frank. That was a wonderful, emotive set of comments. And all of you can imagine the, the nature of the discussion that has gone on between the variety of perspectives that have been represented here. Now, finally, uh, in, and I do regret the absence of Bill Reese, Paddy Deltabaddy, and Doe Stain, all of whom have contributed enormously to the activities. But the last word goes to Graham Wynne, who you should know was the primary author of the 
letter that has been spoken about and which is not necessarily rocking the Board of Governors at the moment, but is filling one of their filing cabinets and maybe hopefully uh, resurrected. Graham, thank you. Thank you, Olaf. That's Graham Wynn, Wynn with a W. My heart sank when Olaf announced to the cohort that we would be presenting in alphabetical order because I knew that coming at the end of the string, I would have a series of very hard acts to follow. And I think that we have seen a good deal of the reason for my trepidation in last spot already today. I just want to thank everyone from Joanne to Frank for their contributions to this reflective discussion. I knew, Frank, that you would be a hard act to follow, and you certainly are, but so has everyone else. And I think this is a measure of just how interesting and effective this cohort has been. But in reflective mode, um, let me say that I'm going to take a somewhat different tack in looking back over our eight or nine months or whatever it has been. And I'm going to try and sum up my thoughts and reflect some of the things that have already been said, not by itemizing specific talks or digging deep into my own psyche so much as somewhat anecdotally. And this is perhaps an appropriate approach for someone at the end of things and in his dotage. So you can think of this as a piece of anecdotage, if you like. <laughs> but I'm going to begin by recalling an incident recounted by the English-born, uh, highly accomplished historian, Simon Sharma. He was recruited to teach at Columbia, appointed to a professorship there very young. He had just uh, published his really important and widely acknowledged book on the French Revolution. And he went into his first class teaching undergraduates, feeling like a million bucks, and thought that you know, given his stature and the publicity that had surrounded his appointment, he needed to really turn on a show. He's an extremely articulate individual and uh, the likes of which uh, we have already experienced this afternoon among some of our cohort. But Simon Sharma talked about his book on the French Revolution. Course was on that. And he began by saying, you know, I know all you kids, you learned in school that there were five reasons for the French Revolution, uh, but this really is inadequate. And history is much more complicated than that, than that. And he proceeded to spin this absolutely enchanting web of interconnected contingencies that made of the French Revolution not something that could be explained by five points in a school textbook, but something that needed really careful intellectual engagement, deliberation, and discussion. And he thought he'd aced this lecture, and there was applause at the end. But then a young lady walked up to him, just as he was picking up his notes, and said, Dr. Sharma, I have something I want to say to you. My parents are paying a lot of money for me to be here at Columbia. And if I go home more confused than when I came, they're not going to be very happy. I don't mean to say that the cohort experience has left me more confused than I was in September. It probably was impossible of any kind of gathering. But I do want to use that anecdote simply to suggest that like, like that young lady who confronted Simon Sharma, I think some of us uh, were foolish enough to hope that we might get the glimmer of an answer uh, about how to overcome the challenges 
of the climate and nature emergencies that confront us. And of course, a part of our discussion during the six or eight months was that nature and climate are only two of a whole battery of closely intertwined, interrelated uh, issues that are social uh, and economic as well as biophysical. So perhaps a little disappointment that we haven't come up with any answers, but I do think that the kind of intellectual probing uh, that Simon Sharma was trying to take his students towards is something that really has been evidenced in the cohort. And if there were a single thing I would say about this experience is that it is that the, the real value in it for me has been in the discussions that we have had in relation to the talks and in the sort of back channel discussions that have come from the colleagues involved with the cohort in the way of readings circulated, uh, comments made, uh, books uh, pointed to for enhancing reading and understanding. This to me, as Olaf I think suggested, was part of that that modeling of the kind of interdisciplinary engagement and scholarship that we have seen too rarely in our careers in this basically siloed institution. That said, uh, I would also like to say that the speakers who paraded before us all took their assignments extremely ser seriously. The lectures were almost to a fault, uh, earnest and uh, compelling and well delivered and backed up by enormous amounts of information. But my re reflection on those lectures uh, really left me with some sense that they hadn't quite gone to the nub of the issues that we were facing. Let me try and put it this way. Each of our lectures came in and delivered their shtick, their information, their enormously high quality research, but they, they did so from a variety of vantage points and each of them in a sense stood and waved to us from a different perspective. Look, the data are that GHGs are increasing massively, but politicians are not doing what they said they uh, would do in limiting emissions. Hydrogen is the coming thing for the future. Forest fires are going to burn because this is what climate change does to trees and so on and so on. None of this I would dispute for a moment, but as we went through the months, I was put in mind of the English novelist and poet, Stevie Smith, and particularly a poem that she wrote in 1957. It was it is called Not Waving But Drowning. And I began to think that these different talks, each of which seem to be waving a flag of concern from a particularly disciplinary perspective, really in some amounted to the sense that we were collectively on the verge of disappearing beneath the waves, that we were in fact as a larger worldly global society, uh, drowning beneath the, the crises that confront us. In the middle of this process, I guess I articulated to the group the sense that we needed a new operating system for the planet. And this was an attempt to put in kind of contemporary language uh, what Frank has put in much more eloquent form as we're consuming ourselves to death and we've got to stop doing this. But I'd like to just elaborate on that for a moment. And again, do this by a somewhat anecdotal approach that references a piece of seemingly uh, rather unconnected writing. So after Simon Sharma and Stevie Smith, I would direct our attention to Michael Winter uh, a Newfoundland novelist whose 2013 book, Minister Without Portfolio, I think is an enormously interesting rumination for our times and for this cohort. It's a big uh, and sprawling 
piece of work in a way, too difficult to summarize effectively in a few minutes. But the protagonist is a man called Henry, and Henry is, in a sense, on his uppers. Uh, Nora, his wife, has just left the relationship, and Henry, who had worked in the oil industry, um, in his despair at losing his love of his life, um, quits his job in the oil industry and is plunged almost uh, immediately into the proverbial slew of despond. He handles neither his breakup from Nora nor his departure from the oil industry well. He cascades into a series of disastrous short-term work contracts. His mental state is that he is bereft and unmoored by the grief that he has experienced and by the guilt uh, he feels both for the personal and environmental damage that he realizes he has caused. He worked in the oil industry for a company uh, that was building oil rigs to exploit the offshore oil fields and uh, in winters telling uh, that construction outfit building the rigs uh, has a sign at its front gates saying make it big here a nice sort of corporate phrase if you think about it a little and so henry had been on the road to making it big in this facet of the oil industry but now in disarray he retreats and he retreats to an outport which michael winter cunningly calls renews spelt r-e-n-e-w-s uh, not in the more normal way and he retreats to what we might think of as a simplified life he goes to an outport he cuts his ties with friends he doesn't have much in the way of access to entertainment, media, television, anything else. He mopes, he putters. He's pretty much indifferent to earning an income. He engages in a little bit of do-it-yourself repair here and there. And I suppose we might say that he adopts a pattern of back-to-the-land living. He's existing in social, ecological, and economic precarity. All his previous expectations of social and geographical mobility and relentless productivity to enhance the lives of himself and his family as the only ways, in a sense, to avoid the perception of failing, of decline, in ruins. He was in this telling really a product of the make it big, move on, do more kind of ethos that I think Winter is critiquing in this portrayal. His life by these standards is in ruins. In the outport that he retreats to, it's being lived in spaces of abandonment. It's being lived in what Anna Singh, the theorist of of modernity uh, and extraction calls the capitalist ruins. The ruins of optimism that capitalist production and national attachments will provide a path to the good life. To quote Singh again, we are stuck, and I think this has been one of the clear lessons of our cohort's discussion. We are stuck with the problem of living despite economic and ecological ruination. This is what various people who've spoken today have pointed to. It is to say that although economic and ecological ruin seem to be large abstract forces, they are the makings of humans, that we have adopted a particular course, a particular ideology, a particular way of looking at the world that we might, picking up on Michael Winter's interpretation here, ground in the sociologist's I, Max Weber's idea that uh, you know it was religion that caused the rise of capitalism, the work ethic, the sense that 
a good life turns on work and prosperity and that abjuring those things is to be idle, to be useless, to be a wastrel. That, I think, is in a nutshell the dilemma that Michael Winter poses through Henry, and it's the dilemma that we all face in 2023. We need to change the operating system of the world. We need to stop consuming ourselves to death, and we need to find ways of moving in that direction to accepting that continuing to chase the holy grail of material prosperity. What was described in the movie Wall Street as the idea that greed is good, that human avarice drives the system and is the way forward, all of that has to be dispensed with. And the real question is how we get to that change. We will not, I think, on the basis of my own deliberations on this over some long time now and, on the and from the discussions in our cohort, get to it by simply reiterating the fact that, oh my gosh, things are serious, they're getting more serious, we're going to get more than 1.5 degrees warmer in the next five years, we're on a highway to climate hell. Uh, we know these things. What we don't know is how to get off that highway and how we can persuade people to shorten their expectations, to recognize that the world of the future will mean a different way and standard of living than the one to which we have become accustomed. Latterly, we have been talking in the cohort about the concept of degrowth, which of course is exactly what I have been talking about in a way. But degrowth is not a saleable idea, it seems to me. Who in this room wants to have a conversation with their children saying, you know, you've got to get used to the fact that your life is going to be, as Vaclav Smeal has it, the great Canadian energy economist has it, about the living standard of people who were your age in 1964. That's just so counter to everything built into the greed is good mentality that it will not fly. And so the big challenge is, I think, how to convince people that the end of consuming ourselves to death is in fact mass mortality and that we need to change the way we are interacting with the rest of the planetary ecosystem. That's a challenge that is beyond me to solve, um, but I don't want to give up hope that we can make some steps towards a softer, more caring concern for ecology, nature, the earth, uh, even if that is not quite in the short term, going back to 1964 standards of living. So I'd like to thank Olaf for the huge amount of work he did into coordinating this group of rather disparate cats who formed our cohort, and to those cats for their, contribu their contributions to our discussions. Um, they were conducted in the best of spirits, um, no scratching, no clawing, um, shared endeavor that, as I said earlier, really reflected the best of an intellectual community. And uh, I think we've all been touched, and I hope uh, the consequence of our being touched by that discussion is that some of our concerns about the problem of the future being fundamentally a social one, as Ralph pointed out, um, is a message that gets wider purchase in the community at large. Thank you.
having the last word is a terrible responsibility. But uh, thank you, Graham, for your thoughts and for the ways in which you have inspired other thoughts. I would like to uh, ask if there are any questions from the distant members. A question from online. Do you want to start with that? Yep, yeah, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our question online is from Jess Brewer, um, and they say, I agree, capitalism is the origin of this disaster, but I still hold out some hope for a technical fix, and I see only one pro promising avenue, nuclear power, which unfortunately has been treated like a pariah in industry, despite evidence that it is far safer and least destructive source of clean power, do quote-unquote we have a position regarding nuclear power? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I, I, I have the, I'm happy to pass it over to you if you want to say more. Uh, I don't think we have position politically at that point on nuclear power. Uh, I volunteer to say a few things because our final speaker to the company, Nancy Langston, uh, who was speaking of something quite different. Kinds of implications of that for our understanding of our place in, in the universe and on Earth. But Nancy As a staunch uh, advocate on the earth, um, trace action is bad and Uh, a grade school student just a few miles downwind from the three mile new is a major event as in Chernobyl or three mile radius this is relatively evaluates risk as well uh, much fossil fuels in and uh, and creature so In a sense, sparks for me the the sense that it still has a pretty bad rap among environmental groups everywhere. And Europe was abandoning nuclear generation left, um, although that has changed a little bit with uh, the debacle in the Ukraine, but. The, the problem is, it seems to me, that information is out there, but it is not really always fully and completely understood or appreciated by people who have the best of intentions behind their, their agitation and action. So uh, nuclear power is an ogre in the environmental movement, um, but some who have started from that position and thought very hard about the actual risks um, would take a more considered and different view. So maybe it is time to rethink this knee-jerk reaction. Thank you. 
Are there any questions in this room? We've got one more from online. If, okay. okay. Oh, um, Judith Hall says, what is Sauter teaching about climate and capitalism these days? Sauter. Could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> Sure. Uh, Judith Hall says, what is Sauter teaching about climate and capitalism these days? <laughs> Do you want to talk? Absolutely nothing. Uh, that, uh, capitalism can uh, deal with the problem, especially on campus event where the government would just keep its hands off logic of, of the market. Um, you know, that market logic would be able to handle this problem. So uh, I suspect that uh, that's uh, willing to be quite so naked in stating where they stand with regard to it. But I think uh, that that a sentiment uh, more or less with maybe a little modification here and there, which is tall sick, um, is uh, to be found uh, in many places on campus uh, and not just the uh, School of Business, but uh, also the Department of Economics. I just want to mention if economists would spend time looking at their own history then they might have more doubt about many of the things they currently hold true and important to solving problems like this. I've actually gone and looked at how many courses in economic history are being offered by departments of economics in uh, in this country, and you'd find three courses in the entire country that have to do with the uh, history of economics being offered by economics departments. History is who we are. If we are not willing to spend time looking at where we've been and what we've done and all the mistakes we've made, then you can bet that we're at this particular moment in time just carrying on with the same nonsense. And that's much of what I see going on. Just a sidebar on that. I've been listening to Bill Gates's ruminations recently about the need for a reformed capitalism. Uh, he hasn't expressed any detail as to how he would go about it. But it does seem to me that we, we are all guilty of, of dualism in our thinking about the uh, various economic systems. And uh, whilst we're not in the same situation as the US where socialism is, is regarded as absolutely unacceptable. Uh, we, we are also quite uh, dualized uh, in terms of the relationship between socialism, capitalism. And I think it was, in, whilst your comments are well-based, uh, Frank, I think uh, we do need to explore options in terms of reformed capitalism of a much different kind than that which exists in our society today. That's just in response to Julie's question, to what's going on in Soda. I was, I grabbed the microphone simply to add a footnote to Frank's observation about the lack of economics departments. A decade ago, I looked through the calendars of all of the economics department. Right. Economics. Uh, was was uh, a sweeping survey that economics among several other variants. I understand that uh, Dean Wont was the last economic historian at UBC. Is that correct? 
Uh, no, it is not. Uh, he was the last person, I believe, to teach the history of economics at UBC. Mm -hmm. But there are, there were economic historians uh, following him, including Don Patterson, who remained in harness for some time. And there was also a, a South American, um, I think Chilean, uh, economic historian who was hired into the department after Ron Shearer retired. I just want to add that I mean, um, I mean the this. I, I agree with what people have been talking about in terms of, of capitalism, and and but one of the real, one of the. Uh, I guess really significant issues that have, have come from this, besides the exploitation and all these other things, is is the weakening of of our of our of our social safety net, the weakening of uh, of government, um, which is you know which has really been set up to be the checks and balances on on the kind of most egregious as part of our economic system and that's just not happening and i i really worry about that because you know if we're moving into this kind of period where people are talking about late capitalism whatever where the, where things are breaking down even more and we have have very weak government i mean it it's it's you know fascism all sorts of other political things can arise and i think that that's kind of a really uh, that really worries me. <laughs> yeah, well, having spent the last two and a half to three years uh, going through an environmental uh, review process for this iron ore mine on the northern tip of Baffin Island, you know, uh, following up on what Penny sa said, uh, you know, assessing the uh, environmental and the social impacts of uh, of what we do is really important, and we don't do it very well. I could write a book on the flaws that are currently associated with the environmental review process for any development project in this country, but it's especially true of mines. And mines, of course, would be a big issue if we go the route of um, solar panels and wind power and electric cars running around all over the place. The results, I think, would be an environmental disaster. But, you know, following on what Penny said, what we what we really need, for example, is, is a stronger government. And we need we need a system where every piece of technology, regardless of what it is, every piece of technology that's being introduced into our culture and our society needs to be evaluated for its social and environmental implications. And we're nowhere near doing anything like that. And consequently, you know, we have run amok, especially since. You know, going back to looking at those those exponential curves, you know, especially since uh, you know the the 1970s, um, we have all kinds of things going out there that are using uh, metals and 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 using substances and doing things to us in ways that we have never bothered to question or critically examine. So we're way behind what needs to be done, and it's not just a matter of. Uh, of um, you know having a putting a friendly face on capitalism, and it's not a matter of replacing capitalism with socialism. There's lots of problems with that too. We need a dramatic rethink of how it is we go about doing things, and I don't care what you call it. It just needs to be dramatically different than what we're doing now. That's a nice note on which to end. I think I appreciate it. Just remains for me to thank Sandra and Sarah and Queenie. This is more true than, than any other time in my life. I couldn't have done it without them. Thank you so much. <laughs>